Thanks, Mara. Sure. Good. Actually, show my face. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I love your background. Yeah, it's it's covering all kinds of terrible DIY sins. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's the beauty of Zoom, isn't it? You can cover up anything with some nice flowers. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And that's a pretty one to use. Thanks. Yeah, I should uh, see if I've got any fossil themed ones in, in honor of your husband <laughs> and his new discovery. Yes, there you go. <laughs> So you can get started when you choose to. We're okay, here. cool. Yeah. I will do. Thank you. Um, well, thank you so much, Mala and Leslie, for having me. I'm really, really excited to be here with so many awesome speakers today. Um, and very happy to be kicking off the lightning talk hour, uh, discussing invisible illness and what it has taught me over the past two years. So invisible illness in a pandemic have not necessarily been a match made in heaven. Um, but the last two years have taught me a lot about surviving and sometimes thriving under difficult circumstances. So today I wanted to share three things that have kept and are still keeping me relatively sane in the hope that they might help you too. Uh, to give you a bit of background on where I'm coming from, I was diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis, which is a chronic immune condition just over five years ago, and it mainly affects my joints, my skin, and my eyes, and often manifests as chronic pain and fatigue. Treatment involves lots and lots of painkillers and several immune suppressing medications. As an additional disclaimer to go with uh, the general disclaimer, I'm not here to give medical advice and what works for me may not work for you. I'm very happy to talk about and answer any questions or my experiences, but they are just that. And you should always consult a medical professional about your own health concerns. So with that out of the way, uh, to kick things off, um, the first thing I'd like to discuss is that it's okay to not be okay. People really like to be positive, sometimes unrealistically so, and I'm often guilty of this downplaying how bad things are because I don't want to come off as depressing or whiny or pushing concerns and worries down rather than thinking or talking about them. Talking about how my joints are painful or my brain fog is bad just isn't fun, so why dwell on it? Prior to my diagnosis, I was lucky that I'd not had to deal with very many prolonged and serious personal issues in my life, but that just meant that I didn't really have the mental tools to deal with chronic illness crashing my 20s. Trying to stay constantly positive, waiting for things to get better, my previous go-to coping strategies just weren't that effective at dealing with something that has no end or expiry. It's a chronic illness, there's no cure. Um, and veers into the realm of toxic positivity, so dismissing and invalidating negative emotions in favour of a perpetually positive outlook. This was not sustainable and eventually led to a big emotional blowout at my doctor, who was incredibly helpful but likely wasn't expecting her Kleenex supplies to take such a hit that day. <laughs> Um, so what did I do to bridge that mental gap from healthy 20-something to being on a first-name basis with my rheumatologist? Shout out to Deepak, you are doing excellent work, thank you. I talked about it. I talked to my friends, my family, my partner, my therapist, and myself. This was and still is very hard, especially for a professional bottler-upper like me, but several good things did come out of it. First, I wasn't forcing myself to be unrealistically and relentlessly positive all of the time. Instead, I was trying to acknowledge my feelings and situation, uh, the good and the bad, process them as being valid uh, and carry on. Secondly, by the time it became clear that the pandemic was big and bad and not going anywhere fast, I was already used to talking to the people in my support system about feeling less than excellent. Um, it's very easy to feel isolated and alone when you're self-isolating or shielding or in local lockdown, but you're not really ever quite as alone as you think you are, and working hard to shore up my support systems and relationships made a really difficult time a whole lot more palatable. Talking about the bad things in life isn't being depressing or whiny, it's being realistic. The entire world was slapped with a hefty dose of reality when two weeks out of office turned into two years and counting, 
And one thing I've learned is that ignoring problems, especially ones with no defined end, very rarely makes things better. Everyone's doing their best under their own sets of difficult circumstances and not being okay is perfectly okay. My second learning is best summed up by misquoting Shrek. People are like onions, they have layers. You only get a tiny glimpse of the outer shell from looking at someone. I mean, just ask the people who've looked at me and said, but you don't look sick. I've never actually responded with, and you don't look stupid, but the temptation is sometimes there. Um, per the title of this session, my illness is largely invisible. And apart from a few patches of psoriasis, I can't even look at myself and go, yes, this woman looks sick. Uh, some days I can hop out of bed and go for a walk, no problem. Others I can't even sit up properly as my joints are so painful and inflamed. And our largely virtual world over the past two years has narrowed this field of vision even more at a time when most people are dealing with chaos and disruption in every aspect of their lives. You can't see that someone suffered a bereavement or that their partner's lost their job or that they're trying to juggle homeschooling and work and illness any more than you can see my immune system attacking my body. But those things are certainly all there and affecting people in their own ways. It's easy to judge a book by its cover, but that doesn't mean you should. And how people look on the surface is very rarely the whole story. Yes, I, I might look perfectly healthy, but I have a whole team of doctors who can tell you that's not the case. Your colleague might look fine on Zoom calls, but that doesn't mean they aren't dealing with their own issues. Rather than making assumptions based on surface level information, just offer people the grace and empathy you would want to receive yourself. So believe what they're telling you about themselves and don't invalidate them when their life doesn't line up with your own experiences of the world. The best conversations I've had about my illness and just conversations more generally um, are when people are willing to listen, learn and adjust their expectations as we go. Which leads me to the third and final thing I want to talk about today that has kept me sane, and that is patience. I don't know about you, but I'm not always the most patient of people. Uh, I'm the person who refreshes the delivery status on their pizza as soon as they've ordered it. So dealing with an illness where treatments can take up to three months before you even start to see a slight difference has been something of a test. And I'm sure everybody here has dealt with their own COVID related tests of patience and endurance over the past two years. I've also had to remind myself to be patient with other people. I'm well aware of my own abilities and limitations because I live with them every day. Other people don't, so they aren't, and I can't expect them to be. Um, what I can do is be patient if I need to explain my condition and give people time to digest. I've had five years to get my head around it and it's still hard. So I don't mind having to, you know, occasionally remind my friends to walk a bit slower or repeat things so that my brain has time to absorb them. So to sum up quickly, recap, it is okay to not be okay. People have layers and patience is difficult but essential. Be kind to yourselves, be kind to each other, and hopefully we'll, we'll stay a little bit more sane. Um, thank you very much for listening. And if you've got any questions, um, I'm just going to have a look at the chat now as well. Um, yeah, just drop them in the chat or ask Leslie or Marla to, um, yeah, get your mic on. I'm happy to talk. Um, yes, Chrissy, toxic positivity. Yeah, the unhelpful support that people offer. So kind of things that people say are like, oh, it could be worse. It's like, but it's not. This is what's happening to me now. <laughs> like, yeah, those kinds of things are never good to hear. Um, you look pretty cheerful having lost many loved ones to COVID. That is, oof. yeah, I don't, it's, people need better filters between their brain yes. and their mouth. Yes, they do. <laughs> Yes. So grief, grief and illness are the two things that most people find very intimidating. Most yeah. able people. It's like I used to get angry at those lines. Then I realized that person is probably terrified inside. That they don't ever they, they don't ever think that it might come to them and it comes to everybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, at least grief comes to everybody, even if you're blessed with a super, super healthy body. There's no mm -hmm. way you're going to get through life without losing anybody you love. No way. It's by design. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, and I'm really and sorry I think for your too losses, that, Mama. that mm-hmm. part of having, like you said, an, an, invi- an invisible illness or chronic pain or something like that is that you have to learn to live with the fact that this is the way your life is now and not let that crush you to, to just say, okay, I have to learn to live with whatever this is. For me, it was shattering my ankle. I fell in a climbing competition and I, my tibia and fibia, thousands of pieces, like shattered. I, I couldn't walk, couldn't drive, was totally reliant on other people to do things for me. Very, very life-changing event, right? And yeah. my ankle will never be the same. Every, every step I take, I, I'm reminded of that, I, and it's that's just life now. But <laughs> you have to find the humor in order to 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 oh, like so live well with those said. types of things, yeah. right? So, so, well so when all the hardware was there, there were these two little screws that stuck out. So so it was my Frankenstein ankle. So that's <laughs> Frankel. But then my other ankle needed to have a name, so it's good ankle. So we got Frankel and good ankle. <laughs> <laughs> because you have to laugh. You have to find something to to not not dwell in that bad space that that really can, mm-hmm. can really yeah. crush you. Very okay. true. Yes. Yeah. So it takes it takes very strong people to live through stuff like this. So you are a very strong person. Yes. Are you, Leslie? Yes, you are. You absolutely <laughs> are. Yeah, and thank you for sharing your story with us today. Yes, that's okay. Yeah. I'm very happy to share with you and <laughs> with everybody else on the call as well. That's right. <laughs> <clears throat> so we still have what about ten minutes? Do we have any other questions that anybody would like to anybody ask want Eleanor? To yeah. Any stories to share? Go ahead and either post in the chat or raise your hand and we can unmute you. Unmute if you know the person, Leslie. Right. I'm I'm saying that because we've had a couple of um, negative experiences on on this, like right. But if Chrissy or Aaron or Drew. Oh sure. Yeah. We know those people. (laughs) Of course. Kathy's here. Yeah. Mary's here. So, Eleanor, so are, Thank you, you, com- are you comfortable uh, sharing your health issues at, at work with your employer and such? Are they open to that kind of stuff? Like, I know each, each workplace is different. So, yeah, yeah, I'm very lucky, I think, in that I feel comfortable sharing with my team and, um, yeah my my employer more generally so um one of the things that I have is I get medicate or I used to get medication delivered monthly that had to be refrigerated within like a really small period of time um so it was something that I had to let HR know as soon as I this was back when you know people went into offices (laughs) before times yeah and before times um so yeah like I had to let HR know that that was something to be aware of um and because like arthritis it can flare up and then sometimes it's better and it's just it can be very unpredictable um I found that it was just a lot better to like make sure that particularly my manager and um like HR were aware that sometimes I might you know need to take a morning off so that I could take extra painkillers and have a nap um and yeah that I'd you know try and make sure that it doesn't impact my work too much but um yeah, when I was first diagnosed, I was a little bit stressed. I, w- I wasn't working at Reggae at the time. Um, that's where I'm working at the moment. But yeah, it was very stressful kind of going like, who do I tell? What do I tell them? Like, because I was still trying to deal with um, and digest what it meant anyway. So like going to my manager and saying like, oh, I've been diagnosed with this and I need to deal with, you know, potential symptoms that might come up um, might affect my ability to like travel for work for example um, like not being able to answer questions because I didn't have the answers myself was yeah it was quite stressful and it's also a bit scary as well because it's like exposing 
part of yourself that you wouldn't necessarily normally share with people um but like I do like I said I talk to my family and my friends um and yeah very open with them about everything or try to be as much as possible um just because I feel like it it just helps yeah and as Kathy has just said in the chat Redgate is an amazing company and it's very supportive so yes I would second that Kathy very supportive Mm -hmm. I totally support um, talking about it at work. For me, I have anxiety and depression. And so, you know, some days I'll come in and I'll be in a super bad mood. And um, I set expectations by saying, by the way, uh, today I'm I'm super pissy, (laughs) Um, but it's not you, it's me. I'm really depressed. Or if I'm like really anxious about something, I realize that one of my coping mechanisms is to talk a lot. And so what I've done is I've warned my coworkers, hey, just so you know, I'm going to talk all day long. If you have a problem with it, um, let me know. And, uh, you know, then I'll find another way to cope or whatever. But um, that is something just, you know, for mental health in general, that talking about it is important. And I I do see how some people may be um, hesitant, but uh, I think if you, if you end up like pushing through and talking about things, you know, if if the company is a jerk about it, then it's a company that you don't want to work for. Um, But I have been pleasantly surprised that I'm super open about it. And I've never had an issue. And I do work in like a conservative industry. And there's, there's just never been a problem. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I think one of the things I found as well is that when you talk to people about things like I, I have anxiety and depression as well, um, when you talk to people about that, they tend to talk to you as well. And there's, um, yeah, loads more people have these invisible illnesses that you would just don't see. Um, and yeah, I think just being able to talk about things like that, like you said, Chrissy, is, uh, yeah, it's really important. And it's great that you feel safe and supported at work to do that. Right. It, and so you in, in talking about it, you create a safe space for other people to talk about it. And they're like, oh, yeah. sweet. I don't, I don't have to like, well, Chrissy hasn't gotten fired and she talks about her anxiety and depression. And so maybe I won't either. And then, yeah, it does create that support group that you kind of mentioned. So it's less about being fired or anything like that. It's more about people getting terribly patronizing. Oh, I'll beat them down. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if I'm in a bad mood, do not mess. Um, but yeah, I, I, I am lucky in that um, I don't have a problem if somebody's being patronizing, especially if I'm fired up um, or e- if I'm depressed, then I'm just grouchy, you know, or if I'm anxious, then maybe I'll be aggressive. And so I, I am lucky in that aspect that um, if anyone's patronizing, what a, what a butthole, you know? Yes. Yeah. yeah, having people say things like, oh, you're too young to have arthritis. It's like, well, can you tell my immune system, please? Serious. <laughs> like, that would be great. Because <laughs> I would love not to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, like Marla, like you said earlier, like people saying, oh, but you don't look sick. Like, what, what are you supposed to look like? Like, you know, people expect you to just lie in bed all day and look constantly sad. Like, that's no fun. That's not a way to live your life. When my dad, uh, my dad died of uh, Parkinson's, uh, partly, uh, partly out of that. And then, you know, very active, good looking guy with a lot of friends when he got sick and I literally saw that when he got sick and when he got you know invalid so many of those friends stopped coming because it scared them to see him like that it's like you know he wants to see you would you mind coming I mean you guys were best friends it's like no you wouldn't get any response it's like the phone calls would never be returned and it's like what the hell? I mean, these people are not your friends. I mean, <laughs> if it scares you that much and if another person's condition scares you that much, then you have some work to do, in my opinion. Yeah, definitely. And like you, you do see 
who your friends and support system are when you're going through something difficult like that and like life changing. Well, this was a great session. Thanks for sharing. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having me, Anne.